Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined by Carrie Brownell, who is a second-generation homeschool mother of five, like me. And her favorite part of homeschooling is the read-aloud time that she shares with her children each morning. Books play a very large role in their family's life. And at this point, they even have created and run a business about books. Or surrounding books. And she is a watercolor artist of bookish characters and designs and runs her own Etsy shop at a fine quotation. In fact, I've been following Carrie, your Instagram for forever at a fine quotation and have purchased bookmarks and various other bookish art to give as gifts. And it's just a beautiful, so side note, everyone should go follow that. <laughs> Carrie and her family are also in the process of opening up their own cottage-based bookshop and tea room to share the joy of books and fellowship with those in their hometown. Now, when I was a kid, I thought if someday I could just get paid to read books, that would be like the best job ever. And it sounds like you and your family have found a way to kind of bring books just into every aspect of your life. That's really cool. That's sinking in that I get to touch books all the time. <laughs> yes. So much fun. Well, will you just first tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and just how you came to homeschooling? Sure. So my husband and I have been married for 16 years and we have five kids. So our youngest is six and our oldest is 14. And um, we are both of us second generation homeschoolers. So he was raised um, entirely homeschooled and then I was homeschooled from third grade on. And so for us, it, the decision was kind of just almost made for it. that. That does, I'm like, no one came along and said, you have to do this. Um, but we, it was just the natural choice for us. Like, oh, it's what we do. It's what we've always done. And so it will be so easy because we already know what to do. And um, so that's kind of what brought us to homeschooling, I suppose, as our parents and the way that we were raised and we liked the freedom and the flexibility that we had growing up. Um, turns out, though, it was a little different if you're the teacher than um, the child being homeschooled. <laughs> wasn't quite as easy as <laughs> we both speculated that it would be. So, um, but that is, that's why we homeschooled. It wasn't some big moment of, hey, we want to try this. It was just, it came naturally. To us. I can relate to that so very much. Uh, being homeschooled myself all the way through, and then my husband was homeschooled through the seventh grade. And so even before we were married, you know, just talking like, oh yeah, we want to homeschool. We had, we both had had positive homeschooling experiences, but I have to laugh at, you know, it's like a little different. You think, oh, this is going to be easy. I know everything there is to know about homeschooling. And then you get into it and you're like, hmm, yeah, no. Wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> Suddenly you realize like you're a sinner and you, then you have children who are their own people and yeah. a little tricky. That. <laughs> so. so Carrie, how have your views on homeschooling and educational philosophy grown and changed over the years? And especially as that relates to your own experience, but then being implemented in your own unique family. Right. Okay. So when I was growing up, my parents were like the first generation homeschoolers. So they were like setting the tone and uh, my husband's parents were doing the same. Wasn't done um, really very much at all. You know, suspicious grandparents, what are you doing to our grandchildren? That sort of thing. And um, so in my growing up experience, my mom wanted to make sure that like all the ducks were in a row, all the I's were dotted, all the T's crossed. And so she decided she wanted to do, um, we used Christian Liberty Academy so that I would have the high school transcript and you know all my grades would be kept and there'd be records of everything. And to her, that was really important. And um, and in Jonathan's family, they were kind of a little bit more freestyling. You know, they got their basics down, but they weren't as concerned with the, the records aspect. So, um, but... I didn't enjoy just picking up a book, reading it, and then taking a test and answering questions. So it was kind of boring. <laughs> that part of, of it was boring. And um, in Jonathan's growing up experience, we both had friends who their families did Ko Konos. Do you remember Konos? Yes. Where it's like yes. they got to build teepees in their living room uh -huh. and dress up like pilgrims and things like that. That just sounded so super fun. Um, so we said, oh, when when we have kids, we're going to do it that way. It's going to be activity. It's going to be, you know, 
playing games and doing art and all of these things and and then we had the kids <laughs> and it was like that is a lot of work <laughs> no, <laughs> no wonder our parents didn't do that <laughs> we don't want to do that <laughs> so so we um probably we I would say there it's been a, a stretch in a learning curve of saying well, that sounded fun, but that ended up being a whole lot of work. So what are we going to do? Because we don't want learning to be boring to our children, like it was in a lot of respects for us. Um, we'd rather it be, and when I say it was boring, I, like, I don't want to, to indicate that I had a bad experience being homeschooled because I didn't, because it was the freedom and the flexibility that came along with being homeschooled. Like you got your, your main work done, but then then you had your free time to do all the other projects and things that you wanted to do. So that's it. So we both walk away saying we had a positive experience. I don't mean to diss our parents or anything like that. Um, so we've kind of struggled a bit to find our groove. And um, a friend of mine was talking to me about Charlotte Mason homeschooling ideas. And I thought, well, yeah, that sounds kind of like what I, I like. Um, what I can envision, what I lean towards. And, and I would say we've probably evolved to that, but through a lot of stumbling along the way of just, just like any newbie homeschooler would also stumble. Um, we had our moments of, well, let's try this. So this isn't working. Oh, let's try that. Oh, that's not working either because it's all tailored to each individual kid. And we have three kids that are adopted too. And so they're um, overseas adoptions. And so there's also language delays in there as well. So it's, you know, we're not operating on the same schedule as everyone else. We're, we're a little more delayed in our timeline um, just because it, it was longer before we were all speaking the same language, but yeah, so I'd say that's how it's it's evolved from from the rigorous like let's keep track of everything um, growing up experience to Charlotte Mason. Um, let's let's read and play and discover and build and grow. But we don't have to call it a program. We don't have to say kudos. <laughs> but we can we can um, read what we want and explore what we want based off of what we're reading. And the kids spend a lot of time outside. And uh, yeah. I think that's going to be such an encouragement for moms to hear because I think there can, because there's so much information out there now and so much about like, well, if you're this kind of homeschooler, you need to do everything on this list. And you almost feel like forced to choose a camp and a path and like be married to this philosophy of education forever. And there's not much um, flexibility almost within the homeschool world now to try things and kind of figure out what's going to work for your own family. And we, we've forgotten, I see a little bit in kind of modern homeschooling, we've forgotten what we knew as those first homeschoolers, like the reason why we're doing this is so that we can have the freedom and the flexibility to figure out what's going to work for our family. And it's okay if like right. you, you try something and you're like, well, that sounded good in theory, but that is not going to work for our family. And that's okay. Right. That's not bad. You haven't failed. Right, exactly. It's it's all a learn as you go, and um, you know, you watch the 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 newer homeschoolers who are like, "What do I need to get? What do I need to buy? What do I need to have on my walls?" And you know, they they're trying to build the the homeschool room, and you, and you kind of snicker a little to yourself, and you're like, you know, "Give yourself a little time." Yes, <laughs> those those posters will come down, <laughs> and then you're like you'll it's just re relax, like give yourself. I think I think it takes at least three years to really figure out your groove and what works. And um, so it's a, if, you, if you try it for one year and say, well, I'll, I'll give it a go, that may work. That may work for some, but I just, I think it takes a little while as the kids grow and age and develop that it takes some time. Yeah. And as you see how even the kids interact with one another and personalities and all that. Right. Well, we've talked about some of that freedom and flexibility, but what are some of your other favorite parts about homeschooling? It's probably strictly reading. Um, so, like, I really books. like it's all the books. Um, that is for for our family. We start the day reading all together, and so um, I I find like I'm I'm not a morning person. I'm working very hard to become a morning person because everyone else in the house is one except for me. So um, 
I, I've gone, I need to be the one that adjusts to that. And I've fought it, but I'm getting into it. But to, to have a quieter start in my day, because I'm more alert in at night than in the early morning, um, our practice and habit has been, let's start the day out with, with reading because everyone's, you know, gathering together. We're all together and we're all being quiet and listening to the story <laughs> and so it's a calm way to enter into the day and not um feel overwhelmed or stressed but just be like this is our relaxing period and the kids all love it too like they'll if we miss it they're sad about it or they'll and when they're asked what's their favorite part of um time we spend in schooling that's their favorite part too so i've because it's like the the calm and happy approach we tend to I'll do our whatever our fun read is and then I'll pick up whatever our history read is and um, kind of work our way through um, things as slowly and quiet and then I let them do things like handwriting and that while we're um, we're doing that so that's probably my my favorite part of the day and as for favorite subjects besides literature <laughs> is right history I like history because history just brings you more good books <laughs> Yes, it does. <laughs> so, how convenient. Have there been any favorite reads that you've had recently in that reading time? Well, it's not, a, it's not, okay, it's arguably not the greatest piece of literature, but we sure had a lot of fun reading Harry Potter for the first time all together. Yes. So um, our oldest one had read it, and um, so the younger ones hadn't been introduced. So we read book one, and that was probably like, uh, I'm noticing even my six-year-old will reference back that book. Um that that's one of her favorite but we're also reading through the little house in the prairie books and everyone is really getting into those and then we live on a bit of property with a bunch of trees with limbs that have fallen down and so they built a little log cabin and house with those and so they're just really getting into the whole little house scene and um, I think they really like those I love how books, especially when we read them aloud all together, they become part of like our family vocabulary and they're like the inside jokes. And if you have younger children, I'm so I have five and, um, and the oldest is 16 when this podcast comes out and the youngest is six. So there are definitely things that like the younger ones, the younger set are being introduced to for the first time. And so it's like almost this rite of passage, like, ooh, now I'm old enough to read the Harry Potter series too, you know? And it's really cool to have those things that you kind of like, well, one day you'll get to be able to read this book that your older siblings love. And it's really fun to see them anticipating that as well. Yes, it, it really is. Well, we know that homeschooling is not always fun and easy. <laughs> so what are some of those challenges of homeschooling and how do you seek to overcome those? So one of, uh, if this, this is actually an encouraging question for me to pose to other people because it's very tempting, tempting, but not altogether true as, a, as an adoptive mom, especially to think that, oh, our, our struggles are because, you know, we're, we're we have adoptive issues going on as well. But then when I talk to moms with all strictly bio kids, then I realize, oh, it's, no, that's not it. <laughs> it's, it's everyone <laughs> um, with their different things. Um, so for, for us um, personally, it, there's, our, our bio kids are so like us in our way of thinking and doing things that it is, the struggle is in not knowing where the other personalities come from or how they're, they're developing. And so like I can predict and know what um, two of my kids are going to respond to either with humor or, you know, um, anything um, personality wise or what their preferences are going to be. And of course I'm learning um, the three other children as well. And I I have learned a great deal um, and I can predict a lot of things um, from them too but at the beginning stages it was extremely difficult for me to figure out like what are they going to feel drawn to call to react to um, uh, so we've got we've got it feels like sometimes when I watch strictly by all bio families it's it's amazing to me because I feel like, wow, they all look the same. <laughs> they kind of all act the same. And um, and for us, it's like, oh, yeah. we we neither look the same nor act the same. Um, so that's my personal struggle in it is just the the different the the wildly different personalities that we have in play. 
um, which might might be the case for other people and it might not um, be the case for other people. But um, yeah, I would say that's probably my biggest struggle. And then um, it, it, I guess time management and discipline on more my part than theirs. Like, they'll remember to do all the work they're supposed to do on their own, but sometimes they'll watch me to see if I'm going to remind them to do the work <laughs> that they're supposed to do on their own. And if I'm not paying attention or I'm not being disciplined, then the work doesn't get done until the end of the day. They're like, oh, I never did handwriting. You know, it's like, you know so it's like, okay, well, I have to be aware and tuned into what's going on. Um, so self, my own personal self-discipline and then just in managing all the different personalities in play. Yeah, I find that even my very self-motivated children, if I go through a season where I'm distracted or for whatever reason, not doing a good job keeping on top of things, it's amazing how those things that you don't inspect tend to all of a sudden just not be done. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very important to all hold one another accountable for sure. Absolutely. Well, I mentioned in your bio about um, the art that you do that is mm -hmm. inspired by, by books and literature, and it's just absolutely beautiful. And I would love to hear a little bit more about your own creative endeavors. Has art always been something that's been a big part of your life, or is it something kind of newer? And yeah, just sort of your story with art. As someone who's not, not doesn't find that part of my my, my nature, very natural. I'm just super impressed by people who are artistic. Well, I should start off by saying I don't take myself seriously at all. <laughs> so um, there's, um, I did take a few art classes when I was growing up with the homeschool co-op that we were a part of. And I liked those. I did a lot of um, pencil drawing classes. And so I like a pencil probably more than I like anything else. I don't know why, <laughs> but I just, I like it. Maybe because I, I can erase it and I can shade it to just, just the right, you know, what I want. Um, so, but whenever, when I did draw growing up, it was always people's faces. Um, I just gravitated towards that. Um, and then uh, it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was just encouraged in our house, uh, either it, for whatever reason, it just wasn't. Um, and so I didn't do anything with it at all. I, I remember I had this one picture that I had drawn this really big project and I had it sitting in the room for a while, but it wasn't, it wasn't mentioned or noticed. And so I just kind of put it, put it away eventually and dropped it as life moved on. And I didn't do any more drawing, which coincidentally is a lesson to me now when I'm watching my own kids draw things is to comment on it and say things about it because it really does matter if a parent says something or doesn't say something um, because I put it away. So um, the, I, then, then, you know, we, we got in the thick of um, family and homeschooling and the kids were always asking to do art things and I was not interested in the mess. So, um, but we had just moved into this new house and some of the carpet, and they'd been lived in by a large family before us and some of the carpet clearly showed it. And so I was like, you know what? They, we had been sick for like a month or something. We hadn't been able to leave our house and um, everyone was bored and, um, tired of being stuck at home and so they were asking to paint and um we so I was like you know what this carpet's going anyway we can pull out the paints and it's really not a big deal if something falls on it because to me I I am I'm not I'm not like a neat freak or anything but I do like order I like order <laughs> I don't I do not like chaos and so but um this was an opportunity to just, it doesn't matter, put on an old t-shirt and here we all are, we have nothing to do, let's just be busy. And so we, um, I started drawing faces again, but this time it was like literary faces. And then I showed it to a few friends and they were like, hey, and I was like, do you think that I could do anything with this? And they were like, yeah, you could do something with that. And so that's kind of where it was born again again it's an encouraging word it's like someone coming along and saying hey that 
that's pretty cool. I, or I haven't seen it there. That's cute. Or, Hey, I like what you did there. Or, um, even, Oh, I like this, but could you change that, um, was helpful too, you know? Um, so that's kind of what got me back into it again. And, and then, um, yeah, that it just kind of developed from there. And I put a few things on Etsy and started an Instagram account and the rest just went. <laughs> and so, um, I don't feel like, like I, you're supposed to use the hashtags at the bottom of your post and people do their paintings and then they're like, you know, artist. And I'm like, oh, I feel a little, like, I don't know if I want to use that word. <laughs> so this is just like play time um, kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's only recently that I've started using hashtag watercolor artists because I just don't feel like I, I don't know as much as other people you can look up um, watercolor artists and they just make these beautiful things they know how to do all of the stuff and you know and I, I was watching tutorials of trying to improve this and that and the other and um and I, I feel like I have improved like when I look back at my first stuff I'm like oh <laughs> make it go away <laughs> that's just so horrible um, and, and then uh, so I'm like even in my shop some of the older stuff that's been there for a while is, is going away <laughs> as I improve my skills and make changes. Um, I think I do things better now. So it's just constant practice and, and doing it. Um, I have phases where I like sit down and, and work on it a bunch and then I'll walk away for weeks and not touch it at all. And so it it generally is born out of books that I'm reading too, or ideas. Sometimes just somebody will say something to me in a conversation and um, I'll be like, that is an interesting, which will, which will lead me to a book, which will lead me to a quote, which will lead me to a, a picture in my head um, of something I could do. I have like, I'm over here getting goosebumps because what I love about your story is such an important reminder, I think for me personally, and I'm sure I'm not the only mom, like sometimes we think, well, I never learned how to do that. Or like, it's all over for me now. But what do we tell our kids? Like, oh, you don't know how to do this. Like you can go learn or be a lifelong learner, always take on new challenges. And the fact that, you know, just because you've never done something or you set something aside at one point in your life, doesn't mean that you can't take it back up and try something new. That's actually very encouraging. I, I need to like, I want to sit here and think about that for a little bit, but we have to keep talking. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm going to be thinking about that. And I think I, I, I would be curious to hear what other people, like how they could find ways to express their creativity. Maybe it's something that they had set aside for a time and thought, well, I guess it's, you know, that was a different part of my life, but something that they could reincorporate in their life now, just as, you know, a homeschool mama who has a little extra time. It doesn't have to be every day, just something that they could do. So I'm yeah. going to be thinking about that. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things also you were talking about is sort of your own experience in childhood with art is something that wasn't necessarily commented on and, you know, it just sort of made you want to set it to the side and not, you know, necessarily pursue that at the time. So then as you think about as a parent and as a homeschooler in particular, you know, why do you think that creativity and art is important to include in our day or how can we encourage that in our children um so one of the people that i've been reading lately and of course i'm going to preface this by saying you have to balance out anybody that you read like um a, a lot of christians would not read this author um and i feel like she has a lot of good things to say and and there's something to balance out is brene brown um she's a i don't know if you're familiar with her she's a um a uh, shame and vulnerability researcher and when I say that it even sounds weird like you know, it's not a shame thing um but she talks a lot and one of the reasons why I like her is because she talks a lot about how creativity is um part of what is being vulnerable it, it, and, and developing relationships with other people. Like the more you create, and I've noticed this is true. So I like read, read her stuff about creativity and vulnerability and watched her YouTube videos and her interviews that she's done. And um, I think that she 
she really has made a couple of good points. And the more that I create, I notice this is so true. Like when I create something, I'm sharing a part of myself and I'm being more vulnerable and open and I'm more willing to make a mistake and I'm more willing to have a conversation about it than before. Like when I first started, it's like, please don't ask me how I do anything I don't want to talk about, um, you know, because I don't know what I'm doing. And, and you know, I don't, there's there's that desire not to be vulnerable, like just just take it and run, you know. Um, and, and now it's, uh, oh, I'm happy to talk about this or I'm happy to talk about that. And um, I'm happy to try something. And if it fails, it fails. And if it succeeds, it succeeds. And um, I don't know what will, so it's just a matter of trying. And I think that um, that's something that is with my own kids. Like when when you can watch their face, I mean, you can watch this in anyone's face, kid or adult, but, you know, they make something and they show you and it's, it's very timid, you know, they're holding it close and, and they show you. And that's a great honor to be shown something that someone else has made. And um, so it's encouraging. I, I think it's important to look at what they're willing to show you that they've made and and find something good to say about it. You know, even it's like a little scribbling, like, guess what this is? Like, I don't want to. <laughs> like, like, why don't you just tell mommy what it is? And um, so, but I, I, but I think it's important for them to say, I will show you something that is part of me. I made it. I put the time and the creativity into it. And how do you say that was that was a worthy use of your time. That was a really good effort you put forth there. That was that was really creative. Oh, how very clever. Um, I think that that's really important. Um, and, and why I am beginning to really believe that art in general and cre um, creativity and ex um, is important to express because it I can see how in myself it's made me more more willing to have a conversation or take a risk and in the way that it works mentally. I, I'm not going to explain it as well as um, Brene Brown is. And again, um, a lot of Christians are, are going to say, I'm not going to read her, <laughs> but I totally understand. That's fine. Um, well, they can just YouTube. listen. <laughs> they can just listen to what you said. That was also very, <laughs> very fantastic. So, so that, that is why I like her. Um, and I think she has some very useful things to say about, about that. And um, that's just been very impacting to me recently. And I think that plays into where we see our children's creativity, whether it be a visual art, um, dance, music, even writing, um, creative writing. I you know I have children mm -hmm. who are interested in, in different um, moods of creativity and art, what what I would consider art. It may not be right. like painting, but right. Um, and so exactly what you're saying, like to realize when they share that with you, it there is a way in which sharing something that you have written or something that you have composed or that you're dancing, like it is a little bit scarier than showing someone your math worksheet. Like there's there's something that you know, is reflecting something about who you are or, you know, in a, in a different way, in a unique way. And so to honor that, um, that our children have, have shown that to us and to, I guess, treasure that and appreciate that. Um, and I find it, I think, harder than to be willing to be vulnerable in that way, especially to my children. Um, and I think that, that if we model that for them, you know, even, I mean, in a sense, not that my podcast is art, but my, in the sense of this like, is. well, I don't know. Okay, sure. Well, you, you were telling about the hashtag artist. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> podcast. <laughs> so. Yeah, there you go. But like the kids know that this is something that makes mom nervous, that I've made mistakes. There are things that have been really hard or challenging. And so to be able to like have that vulnerability where they see behind the curtain, all the things I've messed up or the things that have gone wrong. And um, for that to be okay, I think that that would be a, a healthy just environment to have, whether, you know, we or our children are going to be painters or singers or whatever, you know, none of us may ever do that. But just that kind of aura of it's okay to fail, like to have the humility to like not be perfect at something, I think is really important. I strongly believe that... Um as you know god is a cre as our creator has made us all creative beings and so we all have a bit of creativity and i got to talk to some people and they'll say i'm not creative and, but i think that everyone is just in a different way um some people it's in the area of hospitality some people and you know it's creating these beautiful you know 
table displays and dishes and stuff that I'm like, I cannot do that, um, you know, or, or a painter or a singer or a dancer or a writer or, or um, just creating a, a beautiful home or organizing, being an organizer for other people, all sorts of ways that people are creative. And I think it's very important. And I keep, I've, I've started talking more on my own Instagram feed about how what would it be like if we all pursued what we were really good at? Like, what if we found our gift and then we just took it, took it as far as we could? What if we worked our craft and honed our craft, whatever that is, and we're our own unique selves? I, I think that there's something truly satisfying to me and in, in feeling also um, Eric, Eric Lydell, am I saying that right? Um, where he says, you know, when he, when he runs, he feels the pleasure of, of God. And I think that that's very true. When you find your thing, whatever that is, your thing, um, I feel God's pleasure when I'm creating, you know, it, when I'm, when I'm creating and building businesses in any direction, I just feel like this is the most exciting thing I could be doing. I feel God's pleasure. I feel like he's gifted me in this area and I can take it and I can run with it and I will run as far and as hard as he'll let me go. And I, and what, what would the world look like if we as Christians in particular, all, all pursued our gifts and our talents as far and as hard as we could. I think that's an extremely exciting thought. And um, so I, I hope as a homeschool mom, especially that I can encourage my children and give them the opportunity to try, try, go, run, play, make, create. Yeah. And then it's not a self-centered thing. It's not for our glory. It's for the glory right. of our creator, right? It's reflecting his glory. So I'm just getting even more goosebumps. Good, good, good words. It's fun. <laughs> so. Yes. Okay. So we kind of talked about like creativity and art, I guess, specifically but in a broader sense, since I know you love books as well and ideas, what are some ways that we can encourage our children's imaginations? You mean aside from books? I mean, well, how, how do books maybe encourage their imagination? <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, like in the case of, um, I think choosing books that you read is very important. Um, like my favorite book to hate is Captain Underpants. Why would you read Captain Underpants if you could read any number of other things? <laughs> like, I don't care if the child is a, is a slower reader or a slower developed reader. There are books better than Captain Underpants. So... That's my, that's my book to hate. Um, let's, let's find Flat Stanley, let's find The Littles, let's do any number of it. So, because I think that books definitely influence thought and action um, because every book has a worldview. And so you want to communicate, um, you want to communicate, well, truth and untruth both to your kids and help them be discerning about, you know, uh, the belief systems in books. And then, but choosing a good book, and I'm just going to take our recent um, read of Little House in the Prairie. We're reading through the series for the first time with everyone. And, um, you know, they're building the log house. And so they're, they're putting into practice their reading, they're thinking about it, and then they're building it and um, seeing, you know, how much work that is and how many hours and how many days and, you know, how many weeks have gone by since they've started it. So, um yeah, choosing, choosing the best books you can. Of course, there are so many resources out there um, for choosing good books that foster imagination and creativity. But um, yeah, I like all the ones with, with adventure where kids are doing things that maybe they would they definitely wouldn't be doing in today's world necessarily. Like um, ah, Swallows, Swallows and Amazons. And Amazons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which, um, you know, Beverly Cleary's birthday was just... Well, recently at the time of this recording, and she would have been 105, but she passed away. And one of the things, I, and I love her books, um, but her quote about, um, you know, there's this boy that came in the library and they're like, we want books that are about us. We don't want books about kids that are like sailing on boats and finding islands and things like that. We want to find books that are about us and what we're doing. And so she wrote Ramona and all the other books. Um, which on the one hand, hey, I'm grateful because that's that represents a time gone by as well. Um, and I like her characters, they're they're quirky. Um, but at the same time, she's talking about Amazons and swallows. <laughs> swallows and Amazons. And so um, like, no, 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 but don't ditch those, don't ditch those because when you read those books, you think, I want to do that, I could do that. What would happen if I did that? And you know, kids are building boats out of boxes and um 
making flags that they plant all over the yard. <laughs> and um, it's just, it's fun. It calls you up from where you are and encourages you to imagine what it would be if you did something outside of the norm. My oldest daughter, when she turned 10, actually had a Swallows and Amazons themed birthday party. Fun. So it was very fun. <laughs> she really was on a kick for that series for, uh, for a while. Whereas my youngest son, who um, is six now, he is obsessed with Henry Huggins. I think he's listened. We got on the audiobook. You can get like the entire Henry Huggins series in one audi audiobook, which if you have an audible credit, it's like a bajillion hours for one credit. You should do it. But anyway, um, he has listened to that over and over and over again. He can quote whole sections. And what's interesting is for him, I think it is this like, almost this life that he couldn't actually live because it's like a boy with a dog who just like goes and is this tiny kid who's just wandering the town, you know, completely independently right. and having You're all these adventures. Wandering the town. Yes. <laughs> and like going and doing all these crazy things with his dog. And so for him, it almost, because it is such a, a time difference and a sense of cultural difference, um, mm -hmm. it has that same sense of adventure, like or like the boxcar children, you know, all those great books, right. My Side of the Mountain, where these kids, like, they don't need adults. They just go out and do their thing. I loved those books when I right. was growing up. It's not like I didn't want to be with my family, but I kind of wanted to imagine if I could live without them, right. what would I do? Right, exactly. Or like any um, uh, Nesbitt book where kids are going to find their flying carpet just, you know, randomly. And <laughs> what would happen? So, yes. Well, if you were talking to a new homeschool mom, what would be kind of your big piece of advice you would give her? Probably would say, what are you good at? And then form your schooling around that. Because the things that I feel like I do best are the things which I love best. And the kids are more eager and more drawn into things that they can tell that I really like it. Um, you know, I don't like math. We have to do math. Um, but um, I think it's okay to say things. Well, I, I do anyway. Uh, well, I don't like this part, but we still have to do it. But let's get it done as fast as we can and so that we can get to the thing we like. Um, because I think it's fair to acknowledge, hey, so sometimes in life you don't like everything. You just have, you just have to do it um, and get to the thing you do like. But but focus mostly on the thing you like, because chances are they're going to learn to love that too, because you love it so much. I really think that mom's enthusiasm is like the superpower that we don't talk about as homeschoolers. And I think it's something that we can, it's a real gift that we can bring to our kids. Yeah. I okay. Well, every guest this season, I'm asking these final two questions. So the first one is just, what are you personally reading lately? Okay, I'm reading, I'm still reading at the time of this recording. Um, I had just agreed to be part of a buddy read for middle March and it was supposed to last one month and it's lasting two. <laughs> so, That's a big book. <laughs> but I am, I am plowing through and I am almost done. I am now within an average, you know, an average 200 book range. So I should be able to finish it this month. <laughs> so I'm reading middle March and um, I just finished reading a book which is a new release, which I am very interested in talking about, but I'm not, not quite ready yet, but it's called The Story That Couldn't Be Told. And it's about, it's about a girl in Romania under communist rule and the things that they were allowed to say and not allowed to say and stories they were allowed to write and not write. And it's a very, very interesting book. Um, and Adding that to my library hold list. Yes, and the all the portions that it's talking about her story and the history of it is very good. And then the author interspersed it by creating her own fairy tale, which she ran through it. And the fairy tale is horrible. And so it's like, skip all of those chapters and you will have lost nothing. <laughs> so, you know, the editor did her no favors on that one. Okay. So I feel like mm. if you're reading it aloud, you can read pretty much everything, but not the fairy tale. Um, so that's my disclaimer, um, but it is a middle grade piece of fiction and I found it at Barnes and Noble and I never buy new books that I'm not familiar with at Barnes and Noble, but I was like, what is this title? And then read the first chapter and I'm like, Ooh, this sounds exciting. Um, so, and then I'm reading along with my book club.
Web. I'm reading All Creatures Great and Small, which I've never seen before. I've never, I've never read it before. But that I, is on my book club. We're reading my in real life book club. We're reading that next month as well. Yeah. It's been years I since like I read it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what we're reading. I'm this reading. all sounds we're fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have questions, but I'll wait till the podcast is over. And then I'm going to ask you questions about that first book title. But moving on, I would love to know what would be your best tip for helping the homeschool day run smoothly? Mm-hmm. I think, again, it goes back to knowing yourself and your strengths and weaknesses. Like for me, I know that I'm a slow start in the morning. And if I had my druthers, then we wouldn't start the day until around lunchtime. <laughs> but um, that's not possible because little children do not operate on that schedule. <laughs> and so um, finding, you know, saying, let me find all the easy tasks or the enjoyable tasks and put them first so you can just ease into your day is way better than trying to... Um, muscle through and be frustrated by um the thing you know you know your day you know your you know your time from you know when you're most alert and ease yourself around the day and then if you really need to set something aside to deal with a character issue instead deal with the character issue and set the skip set the schoolwork aside oh i love that yeah you have to figure out what's going to work in the flow of your own family and just like I know I'm like the exact opposite. Once you get to like lunchtime, if I have to do something really important after that, like with my kids that could possibly bring up tears, it just needs to wait for the next morning. <laughs> like I'm, I'm best for anything that's going to cause tears for it to happen first thing in the day. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> well, Carrie, where can people find you all around the internet? You can find me all over the internet. <laughs> um, a fine quotation on Instagram and Lockhart Lane folks on Instagram is the bookstore um, side of things that we're building. All right. And I will have links to that in the show notes for this episode over at humilityanddoxology.com. Thank you so much, Carrie, for chatting Thanks. with me today. Yes. Thank you.